When I'm reading Milton's Paradise Lost, I'm enjoying it on several different levels. The sonorous exhilaration of the exotic, uncanny language. The scale and power of the imagery. The vastness of Milton's learning and knowledge. The degree of prophetic achievement inherent in the work. The scope of his systematic theology. And with that, the presumptuous task of Milton's theodicy. And of course, the mystique gathered around the author and this work. And I hope to use this video to import a sense of all of those elements commingling and synthesized together that culminate in the magnificent experience of reading Paradise Lost, even now in 2023. Hey everybody, thank you so much for watching Leaf by Leaf. Today I am resuming my Western Core series, having left off with the second part of Don Quixote. Next up will be Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. Today we're taking on John Milton's Paradise Lost. John Milton, I mean, he coined more new English words than both Chaucer and Shakespeare, he prophesied that he would leave a great work to posterity two decades before he even started working on Paradise Lost, and he forever changed for the world a story that Stephen Greenblatt refers to as one of the most extraordinary stories ever told. The opening paragraph of the introduction of the edition of Paradise Lost that I read, which is the paperback from modern library that has the snake on the cover and the apple. I actually don't really care for this cover much. I greatly prefer the penguin and the earlier modern library edition that had the Gustave Doré. Nonetheless, the opening paragraph sums up a lot of stuff about Milton's life that we'll be touching on and expanding on and commenting on throughout the video. Milton became entirely blind in 1652, just a short while before the death of his first wife, Mary Powell Milton, followed six weeks later by the death of their infant son, also named John. He married again in 1656. In 1658, Catherine Woodcock Milton died of complications arising from childbirth, again followed about six weeks later by the death of their infant daughter, Catherine. The political cause to which Milton had devoted two decades of his life suffered a resounding defeat with Charles II's ascent to the throne in 1660. Through this time of loss and reversal, Milton kept busy on various prose projects, including his theological treatise, Christian Doctrine, a Latin thesaurus, and his History of Britain. He translated a group of psalms in 1653. He wrote the occasional sonnet, then, probably before the Restoration, he shook off potential depression, concentrated his powers, and began composing the greatest long poem in the English language. His great works, Samuel Johnson declared, were performed under discountenance and in blindness, but difficulties vanished at his touch. He was born for whatever is arduous. Throughout this video, I'm going to be sort of cyclically touching on the historical context, on Milton's life, on parts of his ever-evolving theology. We're going to look at what Samuel Johnson had to say. We're going to look at what C.S. Lewis has to say, Stephen Greenblatt, and William Poole in his great book, Milton and the Making of Paradise Lost. We're going to take a look at Christopher Ricks. We're going to really take a look at why this was such a major task that Milton took on. Why the writing of it, just by its achievement and completion, should be a resounding inspiration for aspiring artists. We're going to glean some insights from Professor John Rogers from the Yale Open Courses class on Milton. And of course, 
we're going to go through the text and I'll navigate around all of my notes and annotations and we'll focus uh, mainly on the incredible language and ideas and images that make this a joy to read no matter what you believe. First, let's take a look at Samuel Johnson. This is the literary critic. And it's, it was so amusing to me to encounter Johnson again, because I, I hadn't read Johnson in some time, at least not uh, direct criticism of an author or a work. I had read through selections from the Rambler and the Eitler and so on, collected by Yale. He's just the classic, tough to please, somewhat curmudgeonly and condescending critic who, even when he has something really good to say, it's like he can't just let that stand on his own. He has to then balance that or freight that with something a little bit cold. In any case, this is from his piece on Milton from his Lives of the English Poets. And in general, <laughs> it, it seems like Johnson sometimes wishes that Milton had never written a single thing, and other times that he's saying, aside from Homer, this is the greatest poet to ever grace the earth. But we get some great things about John Milton's life too, such as his grandfather, also John, was keeper of the forest of Shotover, a zealous papist who disinherited his son, Milton's dad, because he, the son, had forsaken the religion of his ancestors. And so we see that Milton, in his dedication to Protestantism, definitely followed, and his, his just his natural rebellion and individualism is sort of inherited from his own father there. Milton was the first Englishman who, after the revival of letters, wrote Latin verses with classical elegance. When he left the university, he returned to his father, then residing at Horton in Buckinghamshire, with whom he lived five years, in which time he is said to have read all the Greek and Latin writers. And even though it is only said that he did, I think just from Paradise Lost, it's apparent that he really did. This is what I meant by he prophesied two decades before he started writing Paradise Lost. He said, I take to be my portion in this life, joined with a strong propensity of nature, that he might leave something so written to after times, which includes 2023, as they should not willingly let it die. And so I feel a sense of pride that with this video, I'm going to be one of those people who won't willingly let this poem die. Johnson says of Milton, scarcely any man ever wrote so much and praised so few. And it's true, Milton rarely talks about his contemporaries and even more rarely gives praise, Galileo being an exception, as we'll see. He had perhaps given some offense to Italians, to the Roman Catholic Church, by visiting Galileo, then a prisoner in the Inquisition for philosophical heresy. And indeed, Milton was an Italophile. He loved Italian culture. Johnson says, I am now to examine Paradise Lost, a poem which, considered with respect to design, may claim the first place, and with respect to performance, the second among the productions of the human mind. And many people think that he's referring to Homer's Iliad. He has interwoven the whole system of theology with such propriety that every part appears to be necessary, and scarcely any recital is wished shorter for the sake of quickening the progress of the main action. The thoughts which are occasionally called forth in the progress are such as could only be produced by an imagination in the highest degree fervid and active, to which materials were supplied by incessant study and unlimited curiosity. The heat of Milton's mind may be said to sublimate his learning. He can please when pleasure is required, but it is his peculiar power to astonish. And it sounds like Mil uh, Johnson is just head over heels for Milton, but I'm reading excerpts. Like I said earlier, all of this is <laughs> also balanced out by 
more negative jabs. The appearances of nature and the occurrences of life did not satiate his appetite of greatness. To paint things as they are requires a minute attention and employs the memory rather than the fancy. Milton's delight was to sport in the wide regions of possibility. Reality was a scene too narrow for his mind. He sent his faculties out upon discovery into worlds where only imagination can travel and delighted to form new modes of existence and furnish sentiment and action to superior beings to trace the counsels of hell or accompany the choirs of heaven. You'll start to see why Johnson's prose is so addictive um, in itself. He saw nature, Milton saw nature, as Dryden expresses it, through the spectacles of books, and on most occasions calls learning to his assistance. And I just really seized on that Milton seeing nature through the spectacles of books. And of course, I'm considering this in light of Milton's blindness at the point of dictating Paradise Lost. But this, this seeing through books, seeing reality filtered through the lens of books, this is something that we just left off with in our series with Don Quixote. He does not confine himself within the limits of rigorous comparison. His great excellence is amplitude, and he expands the adventitious image beyond the dimensions which the occasion required. Here in Paradise Lost is a full display of the united force of study and genius, of a great accumulation of materials, with judgment to digest and fancy to combine them. Milton was able to select from nature or from story, from an ancient fable or from modern science, whatever could illustrate or adorn his thoughts. An accumulation of knowledge impregnated his mind, fermented by study and exalted by imagination. Through all his greater works, there prevails a uniform peculiarity of diction, a mode and cast of expression which bears little resemblance to that of any former writer, and which is so far removed from common use that an unlearned reader, when he first opens his book, finds himself surprised by a new language. But such is the power of his poetry that his call is obeyed without resistance. The reader feels himself in captivity to a higher and a nobler mind, and criticism sinks in admiration. And so I think that kind of sums up Johnson's whole experience. He needs to perform the role of the, or, or fulfill the office of the great literary critic. But despite his criticism, his sober, objective as possible criticism of Milton and specifically Paradise Lost, that criticism keep sinking into admiration. I love that. He was master of his language in its full extent and has selected the melodious words with such diligence that from his book alone, the art of English poetry might be learned. And in fact, Milton's poetry would go on to be classroom material for learning both Latin and English. This was my fourth time reading Paradise Lost. Now, what's really interesting is that when I looked back and saw the years that I had stamped when I read this, I noticed that I've been reading this every six years, four times in a row. Okay, the very first time I don't actually have a stamp for, but I have 2011, 2017, and now 2023. Uh, I won't think too much about that even though Milton was sort of obsessed by numerology and having been immersed in Milton for a while now, the mind reels at the underlying possibilities of what's going on here. Nonetheless, I decided this time to read A Preface to Paradise Lost by C.S. Lewis before anything else that I read. And so we'll go through this next. Lewis has had his own change of heart about Paradise Lost, and he wants to articulate them and ultimately save Milton from the bad criticism 
which Lewis himself used to agree with. This is sort of a, an ongoing theme with Lewis. Lewis the atheist, who will now share why atheism is wrong, and so on. Lewis does an incredible job of helping us surrender rubrics that have been handed down to us by Romanticism and Modernism that cause conflict with the appreciation of something like Paradise Lost. He reminds us of the importance, as readers, of coming to understand works of art on their terms, not ours. I love the opening epigram he shares from Alexander Pope, even though Pope, of course, will go on to sort of satirize Milton. And Pope, Pope is great in his own way. This, this is perfect. A perfect judge will read each work of wit with the same spirit that its author writ. The first thing, says C.S. Lewis, that the reader needs to know about Paradise Lost is what Milton meant it to be. And one of the things that he harps on is that we have to, no matter what we believe, we have to accept that Milton believed in the core framework of Christianity. And Paradise Lost, the things that are written in there, this isn't an allegory or a fable to Milton. This is what happened. He's bringing us in touch with real happening, something that is true. We go on. If anyone will make the experiment for a week or two of reading no poetry and hearing a good deal, he will soon find the explanation of the stock phrases in something like Paradise Lost. It is a prime necessity of oral poetry that the hearer should not be surprised too often or too much. The pleasure which moderns, which we chiefly desire from printed poetry, is ruled out anyway. You cannot ponder over single lines and let them dissolve on the mind like lozenges. That is the wrong way of using this sort of poetry. It is not built up of isolated effects. The poetry is in the paragraph or the whole episode. To look for a single good line is like looking for a single good stone in a cathedral. What I chiefly want to point out is something else. The poet's unremitting manipulation of his readers. How he sweeps us along as though we were attending an actual recitation and nowhere allows us to settle down and luxuriate on any one line or paragraph. It is common to speak of Milton's style as organ music. It might be more helpful though to regard the reader as the organ and Milton as the organist. It is on us he plays, if we let him. A great deal of what is mistaken for pedantry in Milton, we hear too often of his immense learning, is in reality evocation. If heaven and earth are ransacked for simile and allusion, this is not done for display, but in order to guide our imaginations with unobtrusive pressure into the channels where the poet wishes them to flow. And at first I was a little skeptical as to how far away from ornamentation he leans here. But as I read other criticism and then read through this poem again this time, I actually see the truth of this more. The whole art consists not in evoking the unexpected, but in evoking with a perfection and accuracy beyond expectation the very image that has haunted us all our lives. The marvel about Milton's paradise or Milton's hell is simply that they are there, that the thing has at last been done, that our dream stands before us and does not melt. Not many poets can thus draw out Leviathan with a hook. And I love that allusion to Job there, which is, of course, used again in my favorite American novel, Moby Dick. Milton's thought, when purged of its theology, does not exist. Now this I'm not so sure of. Our plan must be very different, to plunge right into the rubbish, to see the world as if we believed it, and then, while we still hold that position in our imagination, to see what sort of poem results. Milton's version of the fall story is substantially that of St. Augustine, which is to say that of the church, capital C, as a whole. For this is perhaps the central paradox of his vision. Discipline, while the world is yet fallen, exists for the sake of what seems its very opposite, 
for freedom, almost for extravagance. Of his heresies, themselves fewer than some suppose, fewer still are paraded in Paradise Lost. And this is true. While there are a lot of things that were cited as heretical, most of them come from works outside of Paradise Lost. What we see in Satan is the horrible coexistence of a subtle and incessant intellectual activity with an incapacity to understand anything. This doom he has brought upon himself. In order to avoid seeing one thing, he has almost voluntarily incapacitated himself from seeing all. It remains, of course, true that Satan is the best drawn of all Milton's characters. The actual moment at which we were wrenched out of our heaven, the fall itself, may be remembered as so appalling that our hell is a refuge in comparison. Milton should be approached as we approach similar scientific material in Dante. The Commedia combines two literary undertakings which have long since been separated. On the one hand, it is a high, imaginative interpretation of spiritual life. On the other, it is a realistic travel book about wanderings in places which no one had reached, but which everyone believed to have a literal and local existence. The highbrow and lowbrow branches of almost every art are usually specializations from an earlier and more fully human art, which was neither or both. And something of this old unity still hangs about Paradise Lost. I think it is quite true that in some very important senses, it is not a religious poem. It is a poem depicting the objective pattern of things, the attempted destruction of that pattern by rebellious self-love, and the triumphant absorption of that rebellion into a yet more complex pattern. Probably the greatest statement Lewis makes on the poem, in my opinion. From the Yale course with Professor John Rogers, which I really, really highly recommend. I've actually watched through all of the sessions twice now, once maybe the second time that I read Paradise Lost and then again now. And his thoughts on Milton in general, his lectures on Lycidas, and on Areopagitica, wonderful. One of the things that he says that really sticks with me is that in some sense, Milton was trying to remake all of Western culture in his own image. A few things from my notes. Paradise Lost is the first narrative poem in English that didn't rhyme, and this was a big deal, a big disruption. Milton provides a sort of prehistory to classical mythology that Homer and Virgil could not have known because they didn't have the benefit of the story of the fall of the rebel angels. And so some of Paradise Lost is reconciling pagan myth, classical myth, and Christianity. Milton has to surmount his predecessors, Homer, Virgil, Ariosto, Spencer, to a degree, Tasso. Jeffrey Hartman has argued that the notorious Miltonic simile contains its own plot and subplot, becoming microcosms of Paradise Lost. One of Milton's tasks is to square divine providence with free will. This is part of what he calls his supreme task of justifying God's ways to men. He was responsible for communicating with and defending to all of Europe why England beheaded its king and set up a new government. We'll be getting to that more later. The work of defense, justification, and vindication is something Milton got very good at leading up to the writing of Paradise Lost. Milton must depict the perfection of Edenic humanity before the fall in opposition to his contemporary, Thomas Hobbes, who famously described our default prelapsarian human nature in his book, Leviathan. And anyone who is familiar with the law agency from Gravity's Rainbow will recognize the final words. But I'm going to read this. This is from Hobbes. Whatsoever, therefore, is consequent to a time of war. 
where every man is enemy to every man. The same is consequent to the time wherein men live without other security than what their own strength and their own invention shall furnish them withal. In such condition, there is no place for industry because the fruit thereof is uncertain. And consequently, no culture of the earth, no navigation, nor use of the commodities that may be imported by sea, no commodious building, no instruments of moving and removing such things as require much force, no knowledge of the face of the earth, no account of time, no arts, no letters, no society, and which is worst of all, continual fear and danger of violent death, and the life of man, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. And so, yeah, for Hobbes, default prelapsarian human nature is quite bad indeed. And it's against this that Milton has quite a task to depict human nature as by default being good and harmonious. And the political context of that is that Hobbes, of course, is all for a, a monarchy, an absolute government that is ruling people. Otherwise, nothing's going to get done because people are just going to be lazy and at war with one another and fending for their own selves. So Milton's Eden, he has to depict this harmonious living and nature by where humans don't need a tyrant governing them. And you know, this is a really tough task because it's just how it is that in art, in movies, in literature, it's the bad stuff, the conflict, the evil that is what draws us, that it's what keeps us engaged. To just read a book about how perfect things are, this isn't, this is not literature. <laughs> it's not something that I want to read anyway. Uh, it's just like the famous opening line of Anna Karenina, once again, you know, all happy families are alike. It's the families that don't get along, they're each sort of bad and they're own way. And those are the ones we want to read about. So <laughs> Milton has quite a task. Milton calls on Urania, that is the muse of astronomy or science more generally, to help narrate creation and asks her to do a better job than Calliope, who famously, you know, couldn't stop her son Orpheus from being torn to bits. And it's just one of those things that you know, just blows your mind because he's getting he's getting ready to narrate the creation story and he calls on this pagan muse. But yet at the same time, given that he says, please do better than Calliope, you know, she didn't uh, allow or stop Orpheus from being torn to shreds. That you can sense that fear of Milton's task that he's taking on where suddenly he's like, you know, I, I may be overstepping my bounds a little bit here. I may end up like my friend Galileo. Given the prohibition of the fruit, there is this sense, after all, despite all of Milton's Arminianism, and we'll talk about that later, basically free will versus uh, Calvinist predestination, there's a sense in which those first human parents of ours weren't completely free. The fall affects language, and you'll see in Paradise Lost that no one can speak the same way thereafter. And Milton himself even declares within the poem that he has to switch the mode from epic to tragedy. Milton's theodicy, in part, for Adam and Eve's expulsion from paradise is that God had already built into the framework of Edenic nature an incompatibility with imperfection. And so if he's a just God, he has to adhere to that and let them be exposed, expelled. Christopher Ricks, his collection of essays in the force of poetry. If you are looking for books on poetry, how to read poetry, how to enjoy poetry, this is probably in the top five. It's up there with William Empson's seven types of ambiguity. In his essay on Milton, he says, many of the great Miltonic movements are of imagining something which cannot be felt, or rather can be felt only in the imagination. And it's amazing that that's all that I took from this essay to share in this video. But think about Milton the blind poet, and he's spending his nights and early mornings meditating 
and allowing these muses, which there's this famous conflation between pagan muses and the Holy Spirit, to download these stanzas, up to 40 lines sometimes, and then for his amanuensis, or scribe, to show up so that he can dictate the lines. And just, just think about constructing this poem that we now read today. It's over 10,000 lines. And they were originally spoken aloud by a blind man. Many of the great Miltonic movements are of imagining something which cannot be felt, or rather can be felt only in the imagination. And when we start getting into the poem proper, I'll point out these different things. Because, of course, he's talking about things that we aren't reading Paradise Lost and thinking to ourselves, yeah, that chimes, that chimes true to what I experienced when I was in pandemonium, when I was in hell, when I was uh, running a, around the, the orbs of the cosmos trying to find Earth. <laughs> these, these are vast cosmic landscapes that no one has seen, but that you know Milton believes in. And he does impart something of the way it feels in the imagination. And when we start speaking of such things that just really can't be metrically measured or quantitatively measured, this is where we start to get into that gray territory of what I love so much about literature. From Donald R. Pierce's The Style of Milton's Epic, he says, if there is one thing which it might be supposed a professional Miltonist would prize above anything else in Milton, it would be precisely the remote grandeur of his style. It's complete and utter artificiality. Now, this guy, when he talks about the writing of literature that he likes, it's right in line with me. It is when one sets out to relate the diction of Paradise Lost to the norm of the common tongue that one notices a precisely opposite effect, that the norm behind Milton lies in the uncommon tongue, in the learned body of formal prose, theological, philosophical, forensic, descending from medieval and classic tra literary tradition, with which from his youth onward, as cloistered scholar and as public servant, Milton was thoroughly familiar. Paradise Lost displays the virtues of great prose. The remote grandeur of Milton's language in Paradise Lost originates in the formalities of classic prose, a scholastic discipline of thought and word and word order that deeply pervades the entire poem infiltrating even the tenderest lyrical passage to stiffen it as with gold brocade. That's just lovely writing in itself about lovely writing. Here, Pierce could be talking about Henry James. He says the careful interior structuring of the passage, the managed series of subordinations, nudged into the line at the right instance by the reappearing primary sense, conform to a tradition of trained prosaic eloquence in which the art of effectively disposing the members of a complex sentence among its main rhetorical elements has attained a high level of accomplishment. The lines display exquisite prosaic skills that descend to the Renaissance from traditional oratory and diplomacy, an eloquence which Milton learned at school and as Cromwell's secretary for foreign tongues applied in the public service for 20 years. Pierce examines a paragraph from The Reason of Church Government, and he says, Each of the half dozen eddying qualifications helps to produce and distribute the thought, keeping it fittingly complex, yet everywhere articulate and sharp. The carefully placed subordinations, the tasteful suspensions, breathe with the progress of the argument. And while the whole paragraph is a model of dignified discourse, the individual phrases, weighty taken singly, by some minor miracle of handling, almost dance their way into the reader's mind. <sighs> I wish to be able to write or, and or talk about writing like this.
Classic eloquence, then, served Milton in two ways in Paradise Lost. First, it provided a continuous rhetorical device of alienation, imparting an aloofness to the whole action so that the reader is at no time in any danger of ignoring the decisive distance between his natural daily self and those splendid events and persons. Second, it assured Milton maximum precision of utterance, for ancient eloquence tolerated no busy Elizabethan blurring of syntax, image, and idea, and Pierce has Shakespeare writing for the stage, of course, in mind when he says that. The language of Paradise Lost is an eminently studied, eminently professional thing, carefully built up out of the choicest elements and practices of ancient and modern languages. A reader of Milton who possesses any degree of literary sophistication at all is sure, therefore, to experience, as he will with no other English poet, a connoisseur's pleasure, which is that of being constantly aware of moving among rarities, among treasured specimens of the literary art. I think we can be quite sure that his purpose in strewing the text of Paradise Lost with classical similes and illusions was not merely to furnish himself with opportunities to pour forth the treasures of his mind in an excess of scholarly self-indulgence. On the contrary, the effect of all that elegant scholarship was rather to seal his poem off in imaginative literature, to insulate it against life in the untransmuted natural and historical sense at all points in closing thought and image with a protective lacquer of art, and by so doing to increase the sheer indestructibility of his poem by increasing the element of pure artifice in it. Yes, Pierce writes of Paradise Lost that it, it reads as if indeed Milton knew in his bones that he was writing the last poem in England, or in Europe for that matter, to employ Greek and Roman antiquity passionately, that is to say soberly, without irony, sentimentality, or false notes. At some level of his imagination, he must have been aware that the classic world, even for a poet like himself, who was also a professional scholar, was already irretrievably lost and gone, indeed, like the paradise of his poem itself. Stephen Greenblatt writes in The Rise and Fall of Adam and Eve about Paradise Lost and Milton. If the most influential contribution to the image of Adam and Eve was made by Albrecht Dürer in 1504, the most influential contribution to their story was made almost two centuries later by the English writer John Milton. Paradise Lost is, or so I and many others believe, the greatest poem in the English language. But it is something more, an unprecedented, even shocking fulfillment of Augustine's injunction to interpret Genesis literally. Milton took this injunction as a challenge to make Adam and Eve real. And like Durer, he brought to the challenge both every resource the Renaissance had crafted and every facet of his own turbulent life and times, and his poem forever transformed the ancient narrative. Though he emerged from hiding and returned home, he remained in seclusion. According to one of his earliest biographers, Milton was in perpetual terror of being assassinated. Many people wished him dead, but whether he had grounds for his fear is not clear. His public life, in any case, was over. A royal proclamation was issued, calling for anyone who possessed copies of his wicked and traitorous works to deliver them to the authorities, who would see to it that they were burned by the public hangman. And so if we back up just a little bit, what has happened is that Milton started writing these tracts and pamphlets, these treatises, and he started with arguing for divorce that went totally against orthodox views. And then, little by little, he started to fall in with Parliament. And in England at this time, there was this brewing animosity between absolute monarchy of the Stuarts the royalists 
and Parliament. And Milton sided with Parliament and started to argue in favor of a republic, basically, and against the tyranny of a monarch. While Milton was traveling in his beloved Italy, civil war broke out. And when he went back, he still sided with the Republicans, with the parliamentarians, even after they beheaded King Charles I and overthrew the Stuarts, set up the Republic, and then Oliver Cromwell was the protectorate of it and employed Milton, as we heard earlier. And then amazingly, Milton would employ Andrew Marvell. But in any case, Milton wrote not one, but two defenses of the English people in favor of the regicide and wrote these in Latin to communicate them with the rest of the world. It was really appalling. But then, as it would happen, Oliver Cromwell died, the Republic fell apart, and the rightful heir of the royal throne, King Charles II, ascended and the Stuarts came back to power. And so Milton hightailed it out of London and was in hiding. And it's actually an amazing story that somehow he avoided execution himself. He settled upon a routine. This is in his later years, after all that went down and he has gone completely blind at this point. He would awaken at four in the morning, at five in the winter, and lie in bed for half an hour, listening to someone read to him, preferably from the Hebrew Bible. Then for an hour or two, he would sit quietly in contemplation. By seven, he was ready. An amanuensis would arrive, and Milton would begin to dictate the verses that he had composed in his head, that had come to him from on high or welled up inside of him. Everything that mattered most to him, to Milton, his travels as a young man, his intense reading of the classics and of Shakespeare, his sexual longings, the disastrous honeymoon with Mary, the loneliness expressed in the divorce tracts, his theological broodings, the civil war, the council meetings he attended as Cromwell's secretary, the bitter experience of defeat, all of it found its way into the poem. What Milton could bring effectively to the depiction of the rebellion in heaven derived from his years as Cromwell's Latin secretary, listening intently to the deliberations of the Council of State. Probably no great epic poet, certainly not Dante and not even Virgil, has ever had such sustained, daily, and intimate access to the halls where powerful, ambitious men attempt to assert their political will. What is disturbing in innocence is the impossibility of understanding evil. No matter how many warnings you receive, no matter how much you try to imagine it. And I think this was important for me to read. And it got me thinking along the lines of why it is we love Satan so much in Paradise Lost and why we sort of bang our heads against the wall, you know, when Adam and Eve fall, when they go, you know, disobey God. And to the first, I realized this time around that Satan is depicted this way because I think that Milton had no choice but to depict Satan as beautifully, rhetorically beautiful and alluring and seductive. If in fact Lucifer was the shining one, as his name translated to, and caused a third of the angels in heaven to fall, then certainly this is because he has amazing rhetorical powers. His language is has power, is seductive. And so Milton needed that to come through so that there can be no doubt that, well, of course this guy caused all of this turmoil. And then Greenblatt nails it. What's disturbing in innocence is the impossibility of understanding evil, no matter how many warnings you receive. Even though Adam and Eve were warned over and over, they're absolute innocence precludes an understanding of why it would be so bad. And so when you've got this pure blissful ignorance and this beautiful shining 
velvet tongued seducer and you bring them together, this is why the cataclysm is inevitable. And I think that another of Milton's great tests, of course, is to really make the reader feel in the imagination the truth of both of these sides and then the epic tragedy of that cataclysm. By the close of Paradise Lost, Adam and Eve had become so real in Milton's imagination that they began to crack open the whole theological apparatus that brought them into being. They had, as Augustine had fervently wished, altogether lost the shimmering air of allegorical figures. They possessed an insistent, undeniable, literal human presence. This was the kind of presence that Shakespeare had conferred upon Falstaff, Hamlet, and Cleopatra, a presence that signals the triumph of literature. And finally, for our secondary works, we have William Poole's Milton and the Making of Paradise Lost. We're told that the particular focus of this study is on Milton as a reader and scholar, and indeed on how much of this scholarship was provoked and enhanced by his occupation as a teacher, the sort of an intellectual, artistic biography. But then the second half of it is more of a criticism of the poem Paradise Lost. For me, Milton is above all a late, perhaps even belated humanist, but one who pronounced Hellenistic, he perhaps would have said Alexandrian, tastes, and a scholar who, sensitive to the times and led on by his own massive self-esteem, a compound seemingly coined by Milton himself, drew some markedly radical conclusions from his reading. And so it's interesting to balance uh, the Lewis with the Poole because Lewis is more intent on sort of showing how much Milton had in common with orthodoxy through Paradise Lost. But Poole digs much more into what, what, what broke with orthodoxy. And it can be minute and more scholastic. It is an extraordinary promise with two and a half decades and total loss of sight separating the undertaking from its fulfillment. And yet, fulfilled it was. Milton sought to justify the ways of God to men, to render a theologically coherent account of the traditional Christian interpretation of these events, of these historical events. He was, in short, offering a narrative solution to the problems of evil. If God is good, whence evil? His solution was that adopted by many prior and most subsequent systems of theistic belief the free will defense. God created humans free, and their sin is their own fault. This was not, however, an uncontroversial view in Milton's age, where the academic theology of his youth had been dominated by Calvinism, which taught that God had predestined all people to salvation or damnation, and that free will, at least in the theological sense of self-determination of one's salvation, was illusory. This tense balance, even compromise, between the classical and the sacred is fundamental to Milton's project. His divine intentions nevertheless work through the stories of pagan classicism. And the relation between these two forces is what is most interesting about Milton's poetics. I would say the sound of the language and the look of the language on the pages, but definitely a close second, is this constant transmuting between classicism and Christian trad tradition. First, very unusually, Milton's poem does not rhyme. He wrote in blank verse, something more obviously associated at the time with the genre of tragedy, which again, we see in the poem that it goes from epic to tragic mode. Paradise Lost is, in brief, a double fall epic, with a creation epic embedded inside of it and a final visionary appendix bringing the poem to the end of human time. The first divine comedy, set within angelic and human tragedies, and then crowned with the final divine comedy, ending in salvation, at least for the just. This is interesting. We're told that the printer inserted line numbers down the side of the poem in tens, a practice unwitnessed outside the editions of the Greek and Latin classics prepared for schoolboys and scholars. In this quietly assured way, right from the first Paradise Lost, announced itself to its readers as, quite literally, a classic. Ovid is a constant presence throughout his poetry, 
as an author both absorbed and transformed. Sallust was the man whom Milton in adulthood described as the historian I prefer before any other Latin writer. Virgil and Homer structured his epic writing. Milton's whole life was overshadowed by warfare. The English Civil War took place in the wings of a much larger conflict that had been raging across the continent since 1618. The conflict of the Thirty Years' War certainly marked Milton's earlier poetry. Arminianism, that tendency within Protestantism that favored a theology of free will and, in its dominant English form, more ceremony and worship than stricter Protestants could approve, was the defining controversy of Milton's day. And so we take that, I think, now for granted because most people learn something of free will versus determinism. And I don't think it's as raging of a debate as it was at this time. We're coming pretty close out of the Council of Dort, Dorf, can't remember which one, all the Dutch theologians that got together and sort of put that Arminianism together formally, Council of Dort, well, one of those <laughs> in the 17th century. And so it was a lot hotter at that time, I think, than it is now. I could be wrong. I'm not really in those uh, theological circles. Uh, but I think most people today don't feel so much the heat of that. And so when God, when, when Milton at the beginning of this poem says that he's going to justify God's ways to men, I think that a lot of what he's getting at is he's going to prove the tenets of Arminianism or free will versus predestination or determinism. I mean, in the end, I honestly don't think Paradise Lost, I agree with Lewis that it's not religious literature in that I don't think the poem is going to do anything to sway people's spiritual beliefs. But we still have to approach it knowing that that's what Milton believed. That's the spirit in which it was written. The antiquarian John Aubrey famously recorded that at the age of 10, Milton was then a poet. And Milton's brother Christopher, not me, confirmed for Aubrey that as a schoolboy, Milton composed many copies of verses which might well become a riper age. Alongside these signs of precocity, we must place Milton's equally signal excuses of not yet being ready to perform. We encounter this reticence at every stage of Milton's career, from his student poetry to the forced fingers rude at the opening of Lycidas. Awesome poem, by the way. To Milton's self-rallying sonnets on his blindness, and even retrospectively in his acknowledgement in Paradise Lost, itself of his long choosing and beginning late. I knew that On Shakespeare was his first poem, or his first published poem, but what I didn't realize until I read this was that it was actually included in the introductory, in introductory poems at the beginning of the second folio of Shakespeare's work. It wasn't attributed to John Milton, but later when he published a compendium of his works, he was sure to cite the year that that came out, and then you know people put two and two together. But how amazing is that? Your first published poem gets included as part of Shakespeare's second folio. At the time, not as remarkable as it is now. Tasso would prove to be a fundamental theoretical reference point for Milton's own evolving ideas on epic. And it was during this whole Milton immersion for this video that I finally bought Jerusalem Delivered by Tasso. And it was actually purchased thanks to a subscriber of the channel, a friend of mine who has gifted me several times. So you know who you are. Thank you very much. The most remarkable text Milton encountered officially was the Quran. There's a whole section on this that was really interesting that I hadn't come across anywhere else. Although he left university before commencing the higher theological degrees, Milton considered himself to be a legitimate theologian, and all of his work in poetry or prose is instinct with an air of theological authority. Indeed, Milton is a significant example of the rise of the lay theologian of the period, thinkers who were deeply theological in their mentality, but who, for various reasons, pursued their theology outside the vocation of the church itself. One way we can think about Paradise Lost for Milton as itself a kind of experimental theology. 
Milton challenges himself to make sense of the God of Scripture, not simply through theological theory, but in narrative practice. As for the Son of God, another of the major characters in Paradise Lost, Milton argued that he who does not exist from himself, who did not beget but was begotten, is not the first cause but an effect. Therefore, he is not supreme God. Milton's contemporaries would have called him an Arian. That is A-R-I-A-N. Arianism is not to be con confused with the deplorable uh, racist outfit of the Aryan Brotherhood. Um, this Arianism is the, the basically the belief that Christ was not uh, part of the Godhead, that he was a created thing, and therefore he came after God and is therefore not one with God. John Milton's anti-Trinitarianism. For all his Arianism, however, Milton is quite sure about the atonement as blood sacrifice. Christ redeems us not as a mere moral teacher, but by virtue, virtue of his execution, redeeming all believers at the price of his own blood. So in the end, even though Milton has this sort of framework of Arianism and Arminianism and even Socinianism, his theology once you start to really pin it all down with all of its details, both from Paradise Lost and without, is very much Miltonism. The most interesting aspect of Milton's creation, however, is his insistence that God did not create out of nothing, so not ex nihilo. As God was the only being in positive existence at the time of the creation, the requisite matter must have come out of God himself, creating through his recently begotten son, so ex deo instead of ex nihilo. Thus, Milton was what they call a monist. Everything comes from the same matter. The angels of Paradise Lost are not material in any abstract way. Notoriously, they eat, defecate, and even have sex. These are not matters Milton discussed in De Doctrina, or of Christian doctrine. Another example of how the practice of narrative drew out of Milton new insights about the beings he was modeling. Milton's real surprise is in his distinction between the external scripture, or the Bible, and the internal scripture, or the spirit. The latter is the ruler of the former. And this actually, it's not cited, but that belief and that tack from Milton is uh, coincides with 2 Corinthians 3, 4, which says that the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. And so Milton was extending that to mean uh, the letter, to mean even the Bible itself, or, you know, at, at Paul's time, the, the law, which would have been the Hebrew scriptures. Milton was horribly mocked for his blindness. To many, it was not glaucoma, but divine retribution. And indeed, many people saw his blindness as God's punishment for his anti-monarchist views, for his championing and defending the regicide. And Milton was at pains to constantly defend himself and even flip it all the way around and say, no, this blindness is actually a gift from the divine. Paradise Lost, the text, was the result of hundreds and hundreds of encounters with many different amanuenses. Milton's achievement is staggering, and that Paradise Lost was of necessity composed as an oral poem only adds to the achievement. Milton seems to have, to have first dictated the verse in parcels of 10, 20, or 30 verses at a time to whatever amanuensis was at hand, and his nephew recalled that he, Edward, the nephew, would then have to conform the punctuation and spelling to Miltonic standards, and Milton indeed, as we can imagine, had his own framework for even the way words, English words, should be spelled. This threw a lot of people off at first, including Johnson, who talks about encountering, you know, a language that's foreign, even though it's English. A slightly later biography of Milton by Jonathan Richardson modulated Edward's account, though, claiming rather that Milton would dictate 40 lines in bed in the morning and then cut them down to half that number. So, of course, you know, there are two conjectures. There's the school of thought that believe that Milton had everything ready to go and it just sort of spewed out perfectly. And then there are the others that show that actually he, you know, it's, it's a crafted, it's artifice. You know, it's a crafted work that he meticulously cut and shaped.
to get just as he wanted it. That rings more true for me. Regardless of what context readers may have brought to their political understanding of the poem, on its first publication in 1667, Milton, in composing the work, can have been influenced only at a relatively late stage by the disaster of the Restoration. Paradise Lost is in conception and commencement a poem of the Cromwellian period, and Milton's references to the evils of the rest Restoration, if they are such, are late additions to the text, restricted almost entirely to the invocation before the seventh book. And again, we're informed that everything had gone completely wrong, both in his domestic life and in the political life of his nation. And that is the period in which he starts to dictate Paradise Lost. Then we move into the criticism of the poem itself. The poem did not appear for another 20 years and had more to do with the twin disasters of early Restoration London, the Great Plague and the Great Fire. And I hadn't considered that, uh, those, those two historical <laughs> happenings there in London during all this time. And yet somehow the author and the poem survive and come down to us today. Vanishingly few of the corrections to the manuscript are actual verbal changes of this kind. The overwhelming majority are tinkerings with spelling and punctuation. These had no effect on the lexis of the poem, but showed that the blind Milton was nevertheless preoccupied by orthography. Y, the letter Y, for I, for instance, struck him as dated, and so time, T-Y-M-E, is typically adjusted to time, T-I-M-E. In general, his choices reflect an interest in sound over etymology, and Milton liked to indicate emphasis or metrical quality by tiny shifts in orthography. Heaven is heaven with an apostrophe striking out the second E, if it's to be monosyllabic. We is we with an extra E, if emphatic. Milton, in contrast to John Dryden, was now outside the literary institution as fabricated by the publishers themselves. That Paradise Lost would soon break its way back into that citadel was a crucial step toward the surprise enthronement of Paradise Lost as the national epic. And Poole will show that Milton was not without his competitors. Paradise Lost is designed like a complex clock where every mechanism influences every other mechanism. Changes in the motion in one part set in motion changes in the others. Nevertheless, although readers have always felt that there is something exceptionally designed about the poem, no two will quite agree on how best to discern and rank these patterns. In a performance quite surpassing the ambitions of pagan epic, Milton's poem therefore describes almost the totality of imaginable time, from the time in heaven immediately before the angelic revolt to the second coming. Technically, however, Milton furnishes as close to an English version of epic diction as he can manage. He eschews stanzaic verse and vehemently rhyme, so that his blank verse recalls the unrhymed hexameter of the ancients. He is careful to repeat epithets and on occasion whole sections of verse, and he delights in lists, whether of the pagan names of the fallen angels, the competing intricacies of pagan fable itself, or the ringing proper names of world geography. Yet always here too, Milton is pressing boundaries. His blank verse was a deliberate affront to the conventions of English versification. His repetitions carry unique theological current, and his lists boast a historical and geographical range that by implication renders classical epic parochial. Again, Milton had just lived through the Bishop's Wars, 18, uh, sorry, 1639 to 1640, the Scottish Civil War, 1644 to 1651, the Irish Confederate Wars, 1641 to 53, the three English Civil Wars from 42 to 51, and then war with the Dutch twice, 1652 to 54, and then again, 65 to 67, all by the publication of Paradise Lost, which itself depicts great battles. Great, not as in like entertaining or good, morally good. I don't know. You know what I mean. Milton left us almost no statements on Paradise Lost, in contrast to his formal loquacity about his own planned artistic development. 
Nevertheless, the poem made it into folio, and not just that, but illustrated folio in 1688, published by that great broker of literary reputations, Jacob Tonson. And a commentary tradition grew up around Paradise Lost with extraordinary rapidity. This was inaugurated by Patrick Hume, an otherwise obscure schoolmaster who prepared a line-by-line -line commentary on Paradise Lost, suitable to be printed with Tonson's sixth edition of the poem in 1695. It is 321 folio pages in length, longer than the poem itself, a sign of things to come. And almost every subsequent work on the poem, including this one, owes some debt of detail to Hume's work. Hume, whose commentary responded equally to the biblical and classical foundations of the epic, was convinced that Milton had indeed overcome both Homer and Virgil. And this is the quote that I will leave us off with for William Poole's book and for the sort of secondary uh, criticism section of this video. Blake, as in William Blake, and his wife would sit naked in their garden house reciting parts of Paradise Lost. Come in, cried Blake. It's only Adam and Eve, you know. All right, so now I'm just going to go through the book and look at all my reading notes and marginalia, annotation, whatever, jottings, and just kind of talk about it and hopefully impart many reasons why I love reading this. On the title page, I like to jot down a bunch of little general notes and so on. And I just jotted some things, you know, this is unrhymed, this is blank verse, it's in roughly iambic pentameter, which means da 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 da. And it's sort of for English speaking people, it sort of coincides with our natural speaking, our natural cadence or meter. But of course, Milton will endlessly toy with this. It modulates sentence structures from SVO, which is the standard subject, verb, object, Chris kicks the ball, to OSV, the ball, Chris kicks, to SOV, Chris, the ball, kicks, and on and on. And this is something called hyperbaton. And this is the deliberate disruption or reordering of words to, to glean effects. And Milton does this so wonderfully. I think it's really important to have an annotated edition. I do uh, highly recommend, even though I don't like the cover, I do recommend the Modern Library paperback if you're going to read this in paperback because it has inline annotations or inline footnotes. The Penguin editions put all the footnotes in the back and, you know, this gets very cumbersome flipping back and forth. And, you know, it wasn't designed that way, like, say, Infinite Jest. It wasn't designed deliberately for that. It can be pretty uh, disruptive. Is that there are many names, there are many different things that if you can just quickly glance down and, and glean a little more context or a little detail, it's very helpful. One thing that I'm torn on though is that the, the spellings and the syntax is cleaned up a little bit uh, to make it readable for we moderns. I would like to get an edition that sort of preserves the original even having the letter F in place of S's, so it looks like Paradise Loft, just because like seeing the word ways spelled W-A-Y-E-S and things like that, I, I think it would do a lot for me, that visual uh, representation of how it was originally uh, instructed to be written by Milton. Nonetheless, especially if you're a first reader, this I definitely get something like this that has sort of the more modern spelling adjustments and inline footnotes. The style can be taking, taken as cloying or too ornamented, but this is something I actually love about it. In terms of the linguistic play or the linguistic machinations, this constant synthesizing and fermenting in Milton's mind, which had all the command of all these different languages, Hebrew, Syriac, Greek, English, of course, French, Italian, Latin. This would allow him to contrive and mint these neologisms. And of course, like I said, toward the opening of the video, he contributed more new words to the English language than any other author. And in a way, every now and then, you'll start to see the seeds of what Joyce would take to an extreme end in Finnegan's Wake. It takes on the big questions in theology and what's remarked on a lot and that 
uh, always gets me is that here we have over 10,000 lines representing <laughs> like a handful of pages in the Bible. The way that the narrative reads, the way that Milton constructs it, and it's brilliant, is we start off right after the rebel angels fall. And they fall from heaven for nine days, and they're stunned on the floor of hell for nine days. And that's where we come into the poem, is when they're kind of coming to after having fallen. Then there's the great debate in hell in book two. Then we're presented with the plan of salvation. Then Milton, uh, then Satan discovers Eden. Raphael warns Adam. Raphael recounts the war in heaven and recounts the creation. Then Adam recounts his first days. So we get from Adam's perspective the experience he had of his first days as a human being, which is amazing. Then there is, of course, the fall, the fall of man. God visits the garden, and sin and death are lit loose. Then there's the expulsion from paradise, and then there is sort of the final commentary on everything that's going to happen, and then they sort of were left with them walking off into this very uncertain future. Like I said, the, the scope and thoroughness of Milton's systematic theology is amazing as it's dispersed all throughout this poem. And systematic theologies were all the rage around this time too, but we get his bibliology, that is the doctrine of scripture itself. Theology, of course, the doctrine of God. Christology, doctrine of Christ or the Son. Pneumatology, which is the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Angelology is, I think, self explanatory as is satanology and demonology anthropology of course the doctrine of man homardiology is the doctrine of sin soteriology salvation ecclesiology the church and then of course eschatology the doctrine of last things the apocalypse the end the second coming of man's first disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree whose mortal taste brought death into the world and all our woe, with loss of Eden till one greater man restore us and regain the blissful seat, sing heavenly muse. So all of those are clauses that are branched out from his invocation of the muse and his uh, command to have the muse sing. So you know, he inverts that. It could have opened, sing, heavenly muse, of man's first disobedience and the fruit, blah, blah, blah. But instead, we get all those clauses, those prepositional clauses, in fact, um, piling up until we hit that first verb. And the verb comes in the middle. And so to take Virginia Tufte's jargon from that book I reviewed earlier this year, Artful Sentences, we've just experienced all these left branching clauses from the verb sing. Now we get into the right branching clauses in this amazing sentence. So sing, heavenly muse, that on the secret top of Oreb or of Sinai didst inspire that shepherd who first taught the chosen seed. In the beginning, how the heavens and earth rose out of chaos. Or if Sion Hill delight thee more, and Siloah's brook that flowed fast by the oracle of God, I thence invoke thy aid to my adventurous song, that with no middle flight intends to soar above the Aeonian mount, while it pursues things unattempted yet in prose or rhyme. And so that's the first sentence. So like we heard from several others already, you have to approach this sentence by sentence, paragraph by paragraph, sometimes book by book, but let's be practical. So we have to break this habit of thinking that poetry is written so that each line is kind of like this event, which I, you could argue that it's like that here. But the whole idea and the way everything unfolds is more important at the entire sentence and paragraph level in something like Paradise Lost. So try not to read it like this, of man's first disobedience and the fruit, of that forbidden tree whose mortal taste 
brought death into the world and all our woe. With loss of Eden till one greater man. You see how I think that in my brain voice when I was first reading poetry like this, that's more how I was approaching it. And so I lost the thread of what this sentence is trying to say at all. And I lost the musicality of it. And yes, it's studded with all of these different words you may not know, but hang with it because he often does clarify later, such as we heard when he says, on that secret top of Oreb. A lot of people may not know that Oreb is another word for Sinai. And here it's spelled O-R-E-B, where traditionally it's Horeb with an H at the beginning. But he says, or Sinai, and a lot of people are more familiar with Sinai, this. And then so that leads right into, didst inspire that shepherd who first taught the chosen seed. And so we know that that shepherd, talking about Mount Sinai, this is Moses, who's, you know, God spoke and wrote his commandments um, and, and charged Moses to then go down from the mountain and, and deliver them to the Israelites, the, the chosen seed. But then what's so crazy is he's invoking the muse and giving preference to from which height the muse should sing these things. Or if Zion Hill, here spelled S-I-O-N, but is Zion Hill or the, the site of Solomon's temple, delight thee more. And still, we don't even know who this muse is. Milton's chief occupation is denoted here. He wants to, the muse to sing of man's first disobedience. That's, this is the main point of the whole poem. That's the beginning of the sentence. Then the end of the sentence pursues things unattempted yet in prose or rhyme. This is basically Moulton, <laughs> Moulton, Milton's bold declaration of originality. But if I back up just a second, he says, with no middle flight intends to soar above the Aeonian Mount. We get a footnote that the Aeonian Mount is Helicon, the Greek mountain favored by the Muses. And so there's this conflation. We've been given Zion Hill, Mount Sinai, and Helicon. This is that conflation of classical mythology and the Bible that Milton's so famous for. But what he's saying is that with no middle flight intends, we're going high above. We're going as high as we can get. And I love this here. He says, what in me is dark illumined? I could linger on that statement for hours. What in me is dark illumined? And then we get the second main intent of the poem. If the first one is to sing of man's first disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree, then the second major one is justify the ways of God to men. This is an audacious and presumptuous task. Say first, for heaven hides nothing from thy view, nor the deep tract of hell. That deep tract of hell recalls Dante, the inferno, and that image of Lucifer falling with such force that it carves out hell within the center of the earth. And I just love that deep tract. And you can just picture the globe of the earth and this like fireball, this comet, this meteorite of fallen rebel angels falling with such velocity after nine days that they carve out with their unconscious bodies a deep tract that becomes their home. The dismal situation waste and wild a dungeon horrible, on all sides round, as one great furnace flamed. Yet from those flames no light, but rather darkness visible. That was also, darkness visible was also used, by the way, as the title of William Styron's memoir of his suffering and depression. Of course, Satan speaks first, and it says that Satan, with bold words breaking the horrible silence, thus began. What though the field be lost, Satan says, all is not lost, the unconquerable will and study a revenge, immortal hate, 
and courage never to submit or yield. And what is else not to be overcome? That glory never shall his wrath or might extort from me. And we identify and sympathize with Satan because, especially in our post-romanticism, post-enlightenment, post-transcendentalism, post-modernism, we readily identify with pride and will and individualism. God may have cast him out of heaven, but there are things that aren't lost. His unconquerable will, revenge, and hate, the courage never to submit or yield. These are, it's rebellion. And for Satan, rebellion and plotting revenge are now the things that will sustain him. So spake the apostate angel, though in pain, vaunting aloud, but racked with deep despair. Vaunting aloud, but racked with deep despair. Then Beelzebub asserts some trade-offs, the, the mind, the spirit, vigor, um, you know, with the losses of glory and happiness, of course. But is it enough to have some intellect and vigor at the loss of glory and happiness? For the mind and spirit remains invincible, and vigor soon returns, though all our glory extinct. The happy state here swallowed up in endless misery. But what if he, our conqueror, Beelzebub is referring to God, of course, whom I now of force believe almighty, since no less than such could have overpowered such a force as ours, have left us this our spirit and strength entire, strongly to suffer and support our pains, that we may so suffice his vengeful ire, or do him mightier service as his thralls by right of war, whatever his business be here in the heart of hell to work in fire, or do his errands in the gloomy deep. So Beelzeb Beelzebub makes this incredible assertion that, well, first of all, we note that he recognizes God's omnipotence, that is, his, he's all-powerful, and so he has conquered them. And Beelzebub is asserting that maybe he's left us this vigor and this self-will, uh, this determination, this strength for revenge, only because he still knows that he needs to use us as pawns for his game, chess pieces, basically. And so Satan then answers, to do aught good never will be our task but ever to do ill our soul delight, as being the contrary to his high will whom we resist. If then his providence out of our evil seek to bring forth good, our labor must be to pervert that end, and out of good still to find means of evil. This is an amazing response to Beelzebub on God's uh, sovereignty and absolute goodness. And it just shows this, this rhetoric reads beautifully and it's almost oratorically inspiring, yet it's so evil. And so later he says, consult or let us consult how we may henceforth most offend our enemy. So they know they can't win. They can't win the battle, the true battle. They've just lost the literal battle against God. And so they'll settle for just offending. And of course, this ultimate offense, this ultimate perversion of good is going to come in the form of tempting Eve. Forthwith upright he rears from off the pool his mighty stature. Listen to how that sounds. He's just talking about, you know, that he, he's getting up <laughs> from the ground. Forthwith upright he rears from off the pool his mighty stature. On each hand the flames driven backward slope their pointing spires and rolled in billows, leave in the, most, in the midst a horrid veil. Farewell, happy fields where joy forever dwells. Hail, horrors. Hail, infernal world. And thou profoundest hell receive thy new possessor. This is sort of Satan's self-enunciation as the ruler of this subterranean world. 
This is these these two lines are some of the most quoted lines in the whole epic. The mind is its own place and in itself can make a heaven of hell, a hell of heaven. And I just wrote a note, compare that to Hamlet, where it says that you could be bounded by a nutshell and still count yourself a king of infinite space. In a sense, that's what Satan's doing here. Even though he's bounded in this restricted space, he is treating himself as the ruler of an infinite realm. And again, when he says the mind is its own place and itself can make a heaven of hell, a hell of heaven, in a little while we will see that sin personified will literally be birthed out of the head, out of the mind of Satan. In my choice, to reign is worth ambition, though in hell. Better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. This is the ultimate rebellion, the ultimate pride. I must reign. I must rule at all costs. Never serve. Here's one of the famous Miltonic similes. And just note the vocabulary, the grammatical structure, and just the shifting scales of imagery. His spear, Satan's spear, to equal which the tallest pine hewn on Norwegian hills, to be the mast of some great amiral, that is a ship, were but a wand. He walked with to support an easy steps over the burning marl, not like those steps on heaven's azure, and the torrid climb smote on him sore besides, vaulted with fire. Listen to all the events and moments and actions that are all gathered together and compacted in this passage. Nor did Israel escape the infection when their borrowed gold composed the calf in Oreb. That's referring to when Moses ascended Sinai or Mount Oreb as it's uh, articulated here to receive the commandments from God, the Israelites started to become fearful without their leader. And, you know, they had been in Egypt for so long and worshipped a lot of the Egyptian and pagan deities that they went back to their old ways of worshipping something that they could see, something material. And so they made the golden calf. So that's what it's talking about, their borrowed gold, because the gold was borrowed from Egypt. And the rebel king doubled that sin in, in Bethel and in Dan. That is talking about Jeroboam, who will, people will be worshiping not one golden calf, but two. So doubled that sin. Likening his maker to the grazed ox, Jehovah, who in one night when he passed from Egypt marching, equaled with one stroke both her firstborn and all her bleeding gods. So this is in when the Hebrews depart from Egypt, Jehovah smites all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. Belial came last, than whom a spirit more lewd fell not from heaven, or more gross to love vice for itself. To him no temple stood or altar smoked, yet who more oft than he in temples and at altars, when the priest turns atheist, as did Eli's sons, who filled with lust and violence the house of God. He above the rest in shape, and gesture proudly eminent, stood like a tower. His form had not yet lost all her original brightness. This is talking about Lucifer. So even after the fall, I guess he was so bright in heaven that there's still a glow, nor appeared less than archangel ruined, and the excess of glory obscured. Here we go. Here's a beautiful simile. As when the sun new risen looks through the horizontal misty air shorn of its beams, or from behind the moon in dim eclipse disastrous twilight sheds on half the nations, and with fear of change perplexes monarchs. Darkened so, yet shone above them all the archangel, but his face deep scars of thunder had entrenched. Wow, I mean, what a powerful image of Lucifer's face. Deep scars of thunder had entrenched, that word trench again, 
earlier we saw it as the, the tract of hell here, uh, echoed, I believe, in trench. And care sat on his faded cheek, but under brows of dauntless courage and considerate pride, waiting revenge. Here's where we get a glimpse of the deception of Satan. For who can yet believe, though after loss, that all these puissant legions, puissant is, comes from the French, it means powerful, whose exile hath emptied heaven, shall fail to reascend self-raised and repossess their native seat. Hath emptied heaven. And as we know, and as Milton counts on his readers knowing, only a third of the angels fell. And so this is deceptive. You know, this is, um, this is Satan uh, fudging a little bit to make his rhetorical point, saying that hell, he basically emptied hell. Uh, and then the emphasis, of course, is on being self-raised. This is, this is the allure of self-reliance. This is talking about Belial. And these are, this is the, the different uh, fallen angels discussing what they're going to do now still. Uh, we're in book two. This is in Pandemonium, which by the word Pandemonium is a word coined by Milton. Though his tongue dropped manna, and could make the worse appear the better reason to perplex and dash maturest counsels. For his thoughts were low, to vice industrious, but to nobler deeds timorous and slothful. All right, so here's Belial. Our final hope is flat despair. We must exasperate the almighty victor to spend all his rage, and that must end us. That must be our cure to be no more. And so Belial's basically saying, let's provoke God to, to annihilation. Sad cure, for who would lose, though full of pain, this intellectual being? Those thoughts that wander through eternity, to perish rather, swallowed up and lost in the wide womb of uncreated night, devoid of sense and motion. And in Revelation, it does speak of an ultimate annihilation of evil, of, of hell. And, but, I mean, goodness, swallowed up and lost in the wide womb of uncreated night. This is fine, fine writing. Here's Mammon speaking. Let us rather seek our own good from ourselves and from our own live to ourselves though in this vast recess, free and to none accountable, preferring hard liberty before the easy yoke of servile pomp. <laughs> this is amazing. He's, he's agreeing with Satan. And work ease out of pain through labor and endurance. And so in Mammon's uh, summation, you can learn to live with anything. Yes, we're suffering and going to be in pain, but we can work, we can figure out a way to bring forth ease, leisure, comfort out of pain. As he our darkness, cannot we his light imitate when we please? This, this is an amazing statement that is so loaded with ideas and just fodder for our intellect, our imaginations. He's talking about God, of course. As he our darkness, cannot we his light imitate when we please? He's proposing that God has, or at least has the ability to imitate their darkness. And now here's Beelzebub. What if we find some easier enterprise? There is a place, if ancient and prophetic fame in heaven err not, another world, the happy seat of some new race called man about this time to be created like us, though less in power and excellence, but favored more of him who rules above. So was his will pronounced among the gods and by an oath that shook heaven's whole circumference confirmed. Tither let us bend all our thoughts to learn what creatures there inhabit, of what mold or substance, how endued, and what their power and where their weakness, how attempted best by force or subtlety. And of course, they'll find that it will be in subtlety. 
Here is a great example of Milton creating what's called a nominalized adjective, or that is making a noun out of an adjective, um, and, and also making it sort of a, an adjectival nominalized adjective. That is, it has an adjective and then a nominalized adjective. But he says, and through the palpable obscure. Let me back up. Who shall tempt with wandering feet the dark, unbottomed, infinite abyss, and through the palpable obscure find out his uncouth way? I love that, the palpable obscure. And then we get hit with another one. Over the vast abrupt, ere he arrived, the happy isle. So the palpable obscure and the vast abrupt. Beautifully crafted phrases. Towards him they bend with awful reverence prone. Towards him they bend with awful reverence prone. And again, you'll want these annotated editions because when you get to something like, man had not hellish foes he now besides that day and night for his destruction wait. When you see that word E-N-O-W, E now, I had to look and it's the archaic plural of the word enough. I didn't know that enough could be plural, uh, but it means man had not hellish foes enough besides. Here's a powerful image. Incensed with indignation, Satan stood unterrified. And like a comet burned, that fires the length of Aphiacus huge in the Arctic sky, and from his horrid hair shakes pestilence and war. I mean, just imagine Satan, this horrid hair, and what shakes out of his hair is not dandruff, but pestilence and war. And here is another rich footnote, because it says that this is another example of Milton's etymologically instructive wordplay because comet derives from the Greek comites, or long-haired. Horrid means bristling and derives from the same root as hirsute, or hairy. And I wouldn't have put that together, but that's just to give you a sense of even when you get these amazing image, images with this great language, and articulation, there's so much more to the mechanics of it and the wordplay and the interlocking etymologically and lexically that Milton is highly aware of. This is part of why I think Johnson praised him so highly, um, being number one in design. And here we go with the birth of sin from the mind of Satan. All on a sudden, miserable pain surprised thee. Dim thine eyes and dizzy swum in darkness, while thy head flames thick and fast through forth, till on the left side opening wide, likest to thee in shape and countenance bright, then shining heavenly fair, a goddess armed out of thy head I sprung. This is like Athena coming out of the head of Zeus, right? Amazement seized all the host of heaven. Back they recoiled, afraid at first, and called me sin, and for a sign portentous held me. But familiar grown, I pleased, and with attractive graces won the most averse, thee chiefly, meaning Lucifer or Satan, who full oft thyself in me, thy perfect image viewing, becamest enamored. I love that style. Let's read that again. Thee, chiefly, who full oft thyself in me, thy perfect image viewing, becamest enamored. And such joy thou tookest with me in secret, that my womb conceived a growing burden. And that growing burden, of course, is going to be sin. And so we get these, this erotics, this almost incestuous, uh, erotics of sin being birthed out of the head of Satan, and then the two of them basically engaging in copulation and the womb of sin conceiving death. I think I said sin a second ago when I meant to say death, but it, it's, it's, and I'm sitting here and I'm getting all hesitant and choppy because I said incestuous, but it's from his own self. So 
it even further establishes Satan's character as mired in such selfishness. But ultimately, it could be said that from the mind of Satan came the seeds of sin and death. But now at last the sacred influence of light appears, and from the walls of heaven shoots far into the bosom of dim night a glimmering dawn. Here, nature first begins her farthest verge. And fast by hanging in a golden chain this pendant world, in bigness as a star of smallest magnitude close by the moon. And they've footnoted that the entire universe is like hanging like a jewel on a chain. This is during the journey that Satan's making from pandemonium to this world, which is earth, where man lives, uh, trying to discover them. But this sort of globe-trotting cosmic adventure is painted so beautifully, so strikingly by Milton. When it says that from the walls of heaven shoots far into the bosom of dim night a glimmering dawn, you can just, you can sense the vastnesses of the distances that light itself has to travel. And here's a where we get a parallel between Milton's blindness and Satan. And this is in book three, and a lot of uh, the blindness of the poet who's calling on the muse, of Milton, comes in in book three. But thou revisitest not these eyes that roll in vain to find thy piercing ray and find no dawn. And so you see this parallel of Satan's despair and his eyes searching everywhere for the light, but not finding it. And we can just sense that same very real anguish in Milton himself, who didn't just acquiesce or succumb to blindness. He tried many different things to stave it off, uh, to heal it, to, to no avail. So much the rather thou celestial light shine inward, and the mind through all her powers irradiate. There, meaning in the mind, plant eyes, all mist from thence purge and disperse, that I may see and tell of things invisible to mortal sight. This is the narrator speaking. This is Milton speaking. What, what an image, what, what a declaration of what he wants from God, basically. He's asking God to say, hey, I've lost my vision and I accept that. So, Plant eyes within my mind and let me deliver things to all these other sighted mortals that only I will be able to see. Oh, here we go. Just beautiful, beautiful poetry. Meanwhile, upon the firm, opacous globe of this round world, whose first convex divides the luminous inferior orbs Enclosed from chaos in the inroad of darkness old, Satan, alighted, walks. A globe far off, it seemed, now seems a boundless continent, dark, waste, and wild, under the frown of night, starless, exposed. And ever-threatening storms of chaos, blustering round, inclement sky. Save on that side which from the wall of heaven through distant far, some small reflection gains of glimmering air less vexed with tempest loud. Here walked the fiend at large in spacious field. Satan is about to see this land, and it's likened to some renowned metropolis with glistering spires and pinnacles adorned, which now the rising sun gilds with his beams. I mean, if if you want to, in a single sentence, paint something as this rich and beautiful and perfect Edenic land, what better way than saying a metropolis with glistering spires, adjective, noun, and pinnacles adorned, noun, adjective, which now the rising sun gilds with his beams. I love the personification inherent in using gilds as a transitive verb of the sun as the subject. 
Okay, and now in book three, we're getting to the bit about the sun, which is often cited. And it just so happens that I've been really getting into Philip Glass's opera, Akhenaten. And this, this in poetry about the sun or of the sun, to me, is every bit as beautiful as the hymn to the sun in Glass's Akhenaten. Above them all the golden sun in splendor likest heaven allured his eye, allured Satan's eye. Tither his course he bends through the calm firmament, but up or down by center or eccentric, hard to tell. Or longitude where the great luminary aloof the vulgar constellations thick, that from his lordly eye kept distance due, dispenses light from far. They, as they move their starry dance in numbers that compute days, months, and years, towards his all-cheering lamp, turn swift their various motions, or are turned by his magnetic beam that gently warms the universe, and to each inward part, with gentle penetration, though unseen, shoots invisible virtue even to the deep. So wondrously was set his station bright. There lands the fiend, Satan, a spot like which perhaps astronomer in the sun's lucent orb through his glazed optic tube yet never saw. And there are a couple of things going on here besides just the magnificence, the splendor of this language to talk about the sun. That very last thing, talking about Satan landing there, the fiend, a spot like which perhaps the astronomer in the sun's lucent orb through his glazed optic tube never saw. This glazed optic tube is talking about Galileo's telescope. He built the first telescope. And one of the discoveries he made was that celestial bodies like the sun and the moon were not perfect. They weren't these pure ethereal bodies like we once thought. They had spots and dips and mountains and valleys, or at least for the moon. But the sun had spots on it. And this completely wrecked our conception of the celestial world. But earlier when it says, but up or down by center or eccentric, hard to tell. He's getting at the different models of the universe, the Copernican and the Ptolemaic. And Milton famously is noncommittal to one or the other. He sort of synthesizes them and uses them to great effect. This is Satan talking to the sun. Compare this to the way Ahab talks about the sun or what he would do to the sun. O thou that with surpassing glory crowned, Lookest from thy sole dominion like the god of this new world, at whose sight all the stars hide their diminished heads. To thee I call, but with no friendly voice, and add thy name, O sun, to tell thee how I hate thy beams that bring to my remembrance from what state I fell, how glorious once above thy sphere. He's got to talk the sun down and let the sun uh, know who's really magnificent. And I think some of this is because Satan has now completely lost or has almost lost his shining splendor. And when he sees the sun in its shining magnificence, I'm sure uh, that this makes him extremely resentful and spiteful. It's a, a strong, the strongest reminder of what he has lost. Me, miserable, which way shall I fly inf infinite wrath? An infinite despair, which way I fly is hell. Myself am hell. And in the lowest deep, a lower deep still threatening to devour me opens wide, to which the hell I suffer seems a heaven. This is as if Satan at this point hasn't been able to soar to the rhetorical heights of a Cicero. You know, he's now saying that I am hell itself. And this, of course, leads up to one of his famous sayings, All good to me is lost. Evil, be thou my good. By the way, the word grotesque, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, this is the first such usage in English here in Paradise Lost. And all amid them stood the tree of life, 
high eminent, blooming ambrosial fruit of vegetable gold. And next to life are death, the tree of knowledge grew fast by. Knowledge of good brought dear by knowing ill. There's a detail that really caught my attention when Eden is being described. It talks about how there are flowers of all hue and without thorn the rose. So not a rose without thorns or not roses without thorn, but it says, and without thorn the rose. So again, hyperbaton that Milton employs. And, you know, you, I, I thought about Paul's thorn from Second Corinthians 12. It talks about how he had a thorn in his flesh. Well, it's obviously a metaphor. And he asked the Lord three times to remove it and realized that it must be put there for some use. But this will come up again later, but just keep that in mind that, you know, in, in the Garden of Eden, even roses didn't have thorns. And actually, you know, now that I think about it, a lot of theologians have offered that the thorn in Paul's side was his eyesight. In some of his epistles, I think in the epistle to the Romans, which, oh man, all these little cool little synchronicities are coming in. So consider that John Milton has gone blind and is using an amanuensis to transcribe this. Well, in the same way, Paul's eyesight had gotten bad. In some of his letters, he talks about, hey, you know, this is me, Paul, because the hand because of the handwriting. Um, I don't know if it says this or not, but the handwriting is either sloppy or really large because his uh, eyesight was bad. And so that's how they knew um, that it was from him. But the letter to the Romans, for example, he actually used an, an amanuensis, and the amanuensis greets us at the very end of the letter. And a lot of people have conjectured that the reason his vision was so bad is because of his Damascus Road experience, where he saw the glory of God and it temporarily blinded him, thus changing him from Saul to Paul and taking him from a zealot to the predominant author of what we have now as the New Testament. All right, we start to meet Adam and Eve in book four. Two of far nobler shape, erect and tall, godlike erect, with native honor clad in naked majesty, seemed lords of all, and worthy seemed, for in their looks divine the image of their glorious maker shone. Truth, wisdom, sanctitude severe and pure, Severe but in true filial freedom placed, whence true authority in men. Though both not equal, as their sex not equal seemed. For contemplation he and valor formed. For softness she and sweet attractive grace. He for God only, she for God in him. And so there's this hierarchy. And we brought up earlier... Uh, something about hierarchy, or I think we did. I know C.S. Lewis brings it up, a few others bring it up, but Milton very much believed in hierarchy. Not everybody was created equal. And this was, for him, it was mostly about gender as it pertains to Paradise Lost. And so obviously this is something that's going to be very outmoded uh, today. But in this configuration there's God at the top, then Adam, then Eve, the order of creation. I guess it would be more like God, Jesus, Eve. Uh, God, Jesus, Adam, Eve. Eve, softness, sweet, attractive grace, and then Adam, contempl contemplative and valor and so on. But interestingly, it says that Adam was made for God only and she for God in him. I've always found this so interesting because at least in my conception like we're all made for God I don't really have a lot of places to go with that but other other than to say that you know this kind of stuff's in here and Milton has been both praised and lambasted because of his views on women of course his divorce tracks didn't help just him as a person um, from the different things we know didn't help. But even though we have this hierarchy presented in which the man appears superior to the woman, later or several times it'll say that Eve is the best creation, the, the greatest creation of God. You have to consider 
Milton's conception of role hierarchy in light of that not necessarily meaning a value system, if that makes sense. Or maybe I'm just overreaching. Let's move on. I love how Adam and Eve speak to each other like ancient Greeks. Part of my soul, I seek thee, and thee claim my other half. Now, as Adam and Eve are just cooing and fawning over one another, listen to how listen to this description of what happens with uh, with Satan. The devil turned for envy, yet with jealous leer malign eyed them askance. Let's listen to that again. He turned away in envy. He knows that he'll never experience this blissful love that they're experiencing. And so he turns away for envy. And then just the way that this is expressed, yet with jealous leer, malign, eyed them askance. So he still can't completely turn away. There's still an attraction even amidst the bitterness. This might be the best description of feeling tired. If you want to replace your worn out, unglamorous vocabulary, and for example, if you've got something such as, oh man, my eyelids are so heavy, you could replace it with this. The timely dew of sleep now falling with soft slumberous weight inclines our eyelids. Oh, here we go. So here Eve is called heaven's last best gift, my ever new delight. We start to get hints at that Arminianism when we're told his will though free, yet mutable. And now the archangel Raphael is being sent by God down to kind of fill Adam in on everything that has happened, that's going to happen, to warn him against the temptation. And it says, down tither prone in flight he speeds, and through the vast ethereal sky sails between worlds and worlds, with steady wing now on the polar winds, then with quick fan winnows the buxom air. And of course, I love this because Adam is surprised to learn that he even has the possibility of being disobedient to God. What meant that caution joined, if ye be found obedient? Can we want obedience then to him, or possibly his love desert who formed us from the dust, and placed us here full to the utmost measure of what bliss human desires can seek or apprehend? And Raphael answers, that thou art happy, O to God, that thou continuest such, O to thyself. So apparently... You know, God has set things up for them, but they still have a duty. And here we go with the free will Arminianism more full or fuller here. God made thee perfect, not immutable. And good he made thee, but to persevere he left it in thy power, ordained thy will by natural, by nature free, not overruled by fate inextricable Calvinism or strict necessity. Our voluntary service he requires, not our necessitated. And there's a silent uh, repeat of service. So our voluntary service he requires, not our necessitated. Such with him finds no acceptance, meaning necessitated service or forced servitude. He doesn't find any acceptance, nor can find. For how can hearts not free be tried whether they serve willing or no? Who will but what they must by destiny and can no other choose? Myself and all the angelic hosts that stand in sight of God enthroned, our happy state hold as you yours, while our obedience holds. So even the angels have the ability to be disobedient, as we've seen, of course, at the very beginning of this thing with the fallen uh, angels. Freely we serve because we freely love, as in our will to love or not. In this we stand or fall, and some are fallen, to disobedience fallen, and so from heaven to deepest hell. O oh, fall from what high state of bliss into what woe. And Raphael again, sad task and hard, for how shall I relate to human sense the invisible exploits of warring spirits, 
this sort of parallels Milton's own uh, task that he set up for himself. How last unfold the secrets of another world, perhaps not lawful to reveal. And this is because there is a limit to what God has even shared with the angels, and there's a limit to what the human should even be able to know in order to maintain that level of obedience and free will. This is just beautiful writing again. Or stars of morning, dewdrops, which the sun impearls on every leaf and every flower. I-M-P-E-A-R-L-S, which the sun impearls on every leaf and every flower. Maybe I'm a sucker for the personified sun uh, and these transitive verbs, like the sun gilds and the sun impearls. It's just wonderful. Like I said, Milton has quite a task here to use vulgar, fallen human language to describe such things before there was even human language, such as the battle between Michael and Satan. So the metaphors have to be at least as big as the cosmos. And so Raphael continues, who though with the tongue of angels can relate or to what things like an on earth conspicuous that may lift human imagination to such height of godlike power. Two broad suns their shields blazed opposite while expectation stood in horror. Expectation here is like personified, but there's a lowercase e. Makes me wonder how it was originally. If nature's concord broke, among the constellations war were sprung. Two planets rushing from aspect malign, of fiercest opposition in mid-sky. Here's a, a good line in an image. Of this ethereous mold whereon we stand, and we get a footnote that Ethereus, Milton substitutes the Greco-Latin form of the adjective rather than make the tongue-twisting combination ethereal mold. At the beginning of book seven, it opens up with, above the Olympian hill I soar, above the flight of Pegasian wing, or the wing of the horse Pegasus. And it says the winged horse Pegasus ascended to the heavens of Greek mythology. But Milton has risen incomparably higher to the heaven of the Christian God. And with that Olympian hill and talking about soaring above it, we see a, a link back to the very beginning of the whole book when it's talking about going, where should the muse sing from, from Mount Horeb or the Helicon, Mount Helicon. Still in the invocation, the long invocation in book seven, he says, govern thou my song. Urania, and fit audience find, though few. And so it's just that case of, of the, the true artist writing for a very much an implied reader. And Milton knew that his fit audience was going to be few. And though I don't count myself among those few really fit audience, um, I'm proud to say that I'm going to continue to try to be part of that fit audience because the, the, this poem is worth it. Here's an articulation that basically boils down to too much knowledge being a bad thing. Too much of anything just about can be a bad thing. And Milton was very much about temperance in almost everything in his life except for uh, studying. But knowledge is as food and needs no less her temperance over appetite to know and measure what the mind may well contain oppresses else with surfeit, and soon turns wisdom to folly, as nourishment to wind. And when it said as nourishment to wind, I think we know <laughs> what that's talking about. And we're starting to sort of get into some uh, Chaucer territory with the bodiness that's implied there, which is kind of pretty incongruous uh, in Milton. But it should also be pointed out that there is very, very much about digestion all throughout um, Paradise Lost. And it just so happens that Milton himself dealt with a lot of digestive issues, despite his temperance. With stars numerous, and every star perhaps a world of destined habitation. One thing that may shock people is there are several times in Paradise Lost where Milton implies that there might be extraterrestrial life. 
but of the tree whose operation brings knowledge of good and ill, which I have set the pledge of thy obedience and thy faith, amid the garden by the tree of life, remember what I warn thee, shun to taste, and shun the bitter consequence. For know the day thou eatest thereof, my soul command transgressed, inevitably thou shalt die. From that day mortal, and this happy state shalt lose, expelled from hence into a world of woe and sorrow. But again, we have to weigh this warning and this admonishment with the fact that Adam and Eve still can't quite grasp what a life of fallenness even means. Not less, but more heroic than the wrath of stern Achilles. So Milton here is, wants to surmount Homer or Turnus for Lavinia and in turn surmount Virgil. And the more I see pleasures about me, so much more I feel torment within me, as from the hateful siege of contraries. That's Satan, and still Satan continues to uh, deceive himself. I in one night freed from servitude and glorious well nigh half the angelic name, and thinner left the throng of his adorers. So first it was he emptied heaven of its angels. Now, you know, he realizes that's a little little much, so now it's just half, when really it's still a third. As Eve departs from Adam and is walking away, her long, with ardent look his eye pursued, delighted, but desiring more her stay. It took me a few times to figure out how to read this properly, because the normal word ordering would be something like, he looked at her for a long time ardently, and his eye pursued, like, I don't even know. <laughs> it, it'll take me a little while to untangle it all and, and rearrange it into the way that it should read. But her long, with ardent look, his eye pursued. So, okay, his eye pursued her long, and with ardent look, delighted. Still not quite right, but just the beauty of the way that Milton has arranged this. Her long, with ardent look, his eye pursued, delighted, but desiring more, her stay. Oh, and here Satan twists the semantics of death. How dies the serpent? He hath eaten, and lives, and knows, and speaks, and reasons, and discerns, irrational till then. So basically, hey, I, the, the, serp the serpent, and really, I shouldn't even say Satan. That's a whole other bag of stuff. But the serpent is basically saying, hey, I ate of it, and look at me. I'm still alive. You won't die. Eve doesn't realize that God is talking about a spiritual death. And, of course, we get to the fall itself. Earth trembled from her entrails as again in pangs, and nature gave a second groan. Sky lowered, and muttering thunder. Some sad drops wept at completing of the mortal sin original. Imagine Milton finally getting to this point where he has to narrate the events right after the original sin. How much pressure there must be, especially at this point with all he's done so far. But I think he does a pretty good job. Earth trembled from her entrails. That pretty good just by itself. But he famously, he will always keep going on. As again in pangs, and nature gave a second groan. Sky lowered, and muttering thunder, some sad drops wept at completing of the mortal sin original. Also famously in Paradise Lost, the right after the fall, or right after the eating of the fruit uh, from the two, they see each other for the first time through lustful eyes. And in Milton's story, they can't help themselves. And it says, there they, their fill of love and love's disport took largely of their mutual guilt, the seal, the solace of their sin, till dewy sleep oppressed them wearied with their amorous play. Those leaves they gathered, broad as Amazonian targe, 
and with what skill they had together sewed to gird their waist vain covering if to hide their guilt and dreaded shame oh how unlike to that first naked glory such of late columbus found the american so girt with feathered cincture or feathered um belt naked else the wild among the trees on isles and woody shores columbus along with galileo i think is the, these are the only two actual personages that are mentioned and then lo and behold they have their first argument then we move into book 10 now was the sun in western cadence low from noon and gentle airs do at their hour to fan the earth now waked and usher in the evening cool adam tries to shift the blame not only to eve but back onto god and then god firmly rebuts and puts the responsibility back on adam and when God does this, we sort of get a we we get a glimpse of that tone of voice uh, from out of the whirlwind in the book of Job. But listen to this between Adam and God. Adam first, this woman whom thou madest to be my help and gavest me as thy perfect as thy perfect gift, so good, so fit, so acceptable, so divine that from her hand I could suspect no ill, and what she did, whatever in itself. Her doing seemed to justify the deed. She gave me of the tree, and I did eat. So basically, God, you made her irresistible to me. To whom the sovereign presence thus replied, Was she thy God, that her thou didst obey before his voice? Or was she made by thy guide, superior or but equal, that to her thou didst resign thy manhood, and the place wherein God set thee above her made of thee? And for thee, whose perfection far excelled hers in all real dignity. So basically, nice try, Adam. And so here's where we reconnect hundreds of pages later about the roses. And it says that thorns also and thistles, it shall bring thee forth unbid. So now, you know, earlier we, get, we were given a specific detail that roses didn't have thorns. Now, after the fall do have thorns. I just thought it was a wonderful detail to keep in place with so much time in between. Meanwhile, ere thus was sinned and judged on earth, within the gates of hell sat sin and death in counter view within the gates that now stood open wide, belching outrageous flame far into chaos. Wow. So again, that, that emission across vast distances, such as the beams of light, and this time it's it's sin and death belching out outrageous flame far into chaos. By the way, chaos is quite an interesting figure in Paradise Lost. Since the fiend passed through, sin opening, who thus now to death began. Sin and death are talking. Hell could no longer hold us in her bounds, nor this unvoyageable gulf obscure detain from following thy illustrious track and so basically you get this image of satan's voyage to eden and back having paved a way or built a, a bridge between hell and earth that wasn't there before we're getting deep at that contempt adam had for god like why did you create me just to punish me and here it's turning it around and using the metaphor of when we have our own son and we're also set up here for the glimpse of Cain and Abel that is to come. Inexplicable thy justice seems, yet to say truth, too late I thus contest. Then should have been refused those terms whatever, when they were proposed. Thou didst accept them. Wilt thou enjoy the good, then cavil the conditions? And though God made thee without thy leave, what if thy son proved disobedient and reproved, retort? Wherefore didst thou beget me? I sought it not. Wouldst thou admit for his contempt of thee that proud excuse? Yet him not thy election, but natural necessity begot. God made thee of choice his own, and of his own to serve him. Thy reward was of his grace. Thy punishment then justly is at his will. 
And it says, why do I overlive? Why am I mocked with death and lengthened out to deathless pain? Eve, he really heaps coals over her head. She says, me than thyself more miserable. She's saying, I'm actually more miserable than you, Adam. Both have sinned. Both of us have sinned, but thou against God only. I against God and thee. So there's an interesting early, uh, this could be the first double bind to borrow very carefully uh, and respectfully from W.E.B. Du Bois, who talked about the double bind of a black woman being both woman and black. Here it's, it's Eve bound to both man and God. Book 11, prevenient grace descending had removed the stony from their hearts and made new flesh regenerate grow instead. So prevenient grace is this built-in forgiveness that we can access, that's already there for us, and we can access it out of our free will. And that stony heart made of flesh, that comes, I'm sure it's in here, uh, yeah, from Ezekiel. He'll take the heart of stone and replace it with the heart of flesh. And so we're getting towards the new covenant that is coming with the Messiah. Thou must outlive thy youth, thy strength, thy beauty, which will change to withered, weak, and gray. Thy senses then obtuse, all taste of pleasure must forego to what thou hast. And for the air of youth, hopeful and cheerful, in thy blood will reign a melancholy damp of cold and dry to weigh thy spirits down and last consume the balm of life. This is our a, a wonderful and terrifying glimpse of our uh, mortality. Nor love thy life, nor hate, but what thou livest, live well. How long or short, permit to heaven. So it's saying, but look, don't worry about your mortality. Just always, wherever you find yourself, just worry about living well. Now Adam and Eve are being shown like this, quick romp through all the things that are going to happen all the way uh, to the end of time. And this is about the, the flood and the ark. More beautiful prose. I say prose. I know it's a poem. Meanwhile, the south wind rose, and with black wings wide hovering, all the clouds together drove from under heaven. The hills to their supply of vapor, an exhalation dusk and moist, set, sent up a main. And now the thickened sky like a dark ceiling stood. Down rushed the rain impetuous and continued till the earth no more was seen. The floating vessels swam uplifted and secure with beaked prow rode tilting o'er the waves. All dwellings else flooded, overwhelmed, and then with all their pomp deep under water rolled. Sea covered sea, sea without shore, and in their places where luxury late reigned, sea monsters whelped and stabled. Of mankind so numerous late, all left in one small bottom swum embarked. And to wrap all this up, then wilt thou not be loath to leave this paradise, but shalt possess a paradise within thee, happier far. This is an amazing note to end on, and it's just within pages of the actual ending. And so the note that we end on is that though you've lost the paradise of Eden, there's news because of which you'll be even far happier. And that's the fact that now paradise is something that's going to be found within. This makes us think of the promise from the New Testament that the kingdom of heaven is within you.